Hey, my name is Caitlin McNeely. I am a senior at Campbell University. Um, I am currently a psych major looking to hopefully get my master's in human resources management. Um, so for my paper, I wrote it on George Peter Metesky, also known as the Mad Bomber of New York. Um, he was born in 1913. He was a U.S. citizen, but he did have Lithuanian immigrant parents. Um, to really understand where his nickname came from, we're going to go deeper into what happened when he worked for Consolidated Edison. Um, let's see, in 1931, when a boiler accidentally backfired when he was at work, he um, was disabled for 26 weeks due to inhaling the fumes. Unfortunately, during those 26 weeks, he was let go by Consolidated Edison for being out of work for so long. Even after filing for workers' compensation, he was denied every single time over and over again. This left him jobless due to his injuries, which also led him to be homeless. So no job, no money, no place to live. He ended up sleeping on couches of family members. And with all of this just coming to him, he's disabled. He has no home of his own, no money of his own. He is dependent on everyone else. He just gets so angry. He's beginning to build hatred towards the work that he used to do. So consolidated Edison is who he blames for all of these mishaps in his life, how they didn't help him find some form of income or some kind of help, how he was denied for all of his workers' comp. Um, so he began to hate his ex-employer. He constantly thought of ways to get back at them. How, how does he show them that they did him wrong? So this led him to plant his first pipe bomb, which it, it never exploded, so no one was hurt, but he did put it on the window ledge at Consolidated Edison in 1940 with a note that said, Con Edison Crooks, this is for you. After this incident, that wasn't it for him. He went ahead and planted a second pipe bomb um, on 19th Street, which is a few blocks from Consolidated Edison, but it didn't explode either, so no one was harmed in his little game. Also, at this time, a world war was beginning, so he decided that he would stop his antics because the war was so heightened at the point. He didn't want to really freak people out, make them think it was a terrorist attack. Um, he definitely wanted it to be mainly pointed at Consolidated Edison and, and whatnot. Um, so right after that, he went ahead and started mailing notes to the police department and Consolidated Edison, letting them know that there will be justice and they will pay for their actions. He did sign the letter FP. I'm not really sure why, being that his name is George Muteski. So that was never really explained why he did the initials FP. Um, it wasn't until 1950 that the next bomb was found. This time it was at Grand Central Station, nowhere near Consolidated Edison. So this attack started pretty much just to freak people out. Uh, it didn't explode either, um, but did one month from that finding there was one place in a telephone booth outside of the public library in New York. That one did detonate, but there was no injuries or deaths as well. For the next five years, he placed 33 pipe bombs, which 22 exploded. Uh, it resulted in 15 injuries, but no deaths. Whenever we look back at the letters that he did write um, to the police department, this pretty much led to his demise. Like They just could decipher from the letters who had written them. So in 1957, the police did catch him um, and he was arrested. So if we're going to look at what type of terrorist George was, he was an American terrorist who acted individually instead of part of a group or a large mass, uh, pretty much best described as domestic terrorism from week one that we learned. Uh, domestic terrorism is described as involving acts dangerous to human life that are violation of criminal laws in the United States or of any state. The action appears to be intended to intimidate, uh, coerce a civilian population, or influence 
the policy of a government uh, or even affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping, and normally they occur in the United States. So even though his moves weren't political towards the government, however, he was trying to intimidate and coerce a civilian population. First, it started out as Consolidated Edison, then it went to all the citizens of New York. So when radicalization usually is a result of multiple processes, um, you have individual group in mass because he acted alone and he was pressured only by his own anger and resentment his terrorist actions in line directly with individual radicalization. Um, according to the textbook Friction, when an individual explains that their own bad, bad behavior and they're more likely to blame them on another, aka George blamed it on Consolidated Edison, uh, they ignore the consequences of the action solely due to another's bad behavior. Um, because Consolidated Edison did him wrong, he believes that he can do them wrong or his actions are justified. Uh, if he was to hurt someone who worked there, it was only their fault, not his. Um, so, because they unfairly let him go after suffering many health problems, he began to justify his actions. Um, the individual level factors that made a play in his radicalization were personal grievance and unfreezing. Personal grievance emphasizes one's revenge over an outside party that inflicted real or perceived harm on the said individual. And then unfreezing is when an individual loses touch socially and it can open an individual to new ideas or actions that they probably would have never considered beforehand. But once they were did wrong, or someone uh, influenced them negatively, then they go ahead and these actions seem like the best. Uh, he was the average blue collar employee man. He went to work, made a living, and provided for himself. However, once this incident occurred and there was some health issues that popped up, leaving him without work, changed his lifestyle, he was let go. Um, <clears throat> this led to his personal grievance. He wanted revenge. Uh, he had plenty of free time on his hands. His anger was flustering and growing larger by the day. After all the reactions he was getting in the media and from the corporation, he kept it going because they were noticing him. Uh, even though he was not directly attack attacking or threatening them physically, um, he began to unfreeze. He was pulling himself from society, beginning to put all his efforts and thoughts into his cause. His revenge had taken over. Even though he could not make them give him his job back or give him workers' comp, something had to be done to suppress his anger and make him feel like he had accomplished uh, something to scare them, just like they are scaring him. Uh, when looking at preventing radicalization on this level, not only does Homeland Security help prevent and they study these terrorist groups and different types, uh, psychologists also play an important role in preventing terrorist violence through the development of risk assessment tools, uh, the use of these tools to manage the risk of terrorist violence. It shows us what it is, where it comes from, how do we prevent it, or how do we approach it. Uh, some of the things that have been used are terrorist uh, inter interdicting terrorist financing, so cutting off the finances that uh, terrorist groups get, uh, tightening the border and immigration controls. We're going to disrupt the flow of the weapons and explosives. These are some of the ways that homeland psychologists, just a bunch of different people come together and these are things that are made to prevent. Um, from a psychology point of view, let's see, you can use group therapy, group dynamics, group interaction. These three ideas provide a basis for understanding how these social groups uh, influence behavior at the individual levy, level, including that engagement and violent behavior. So, starting with George, because people shrugged him off, his actions got larger and more dangerous. As a homeland and psychologist might say that as small as the problem was due to the fact that he never killed anyone. He did injure a few people. Um, it was not worth their time and effort. However, it could have been potentially worse if he had been more educated or if he was persuaded to join a group who felt the same um, or if someone had began to 
join his cause. Like he could have been the front runner and someone could have jumped in and been like, yes, I was wrong, wrongly done by for Consolidated Edison. Let's do this, this, and this. And then the larger it grows, the more the action grow. Um, or if he had had more resources. On another note, if George had not been denied workers' compensation, he would have also never performed these acts. I think that if there was some policy in place at Consolidated Edison where an employee is let go, there's something to help him get back on his feet. Because sometimes in this job market, it's not easy to find work, or especially if you get hurt on the job trying to find somewhere that will work with you if you lose a leg or you have breathing problems or you get severely burned, there needs to be some kind of compensation for being in a, in a workplace that is unsafe. Um, certain policies that help bring people out of poverty and provide them education also need to be easily accessible uh, and available to prevent members from of society from joining unlikely groups. This goes for terrorists, this goes for gangs, um, drugs, alcohol, all of that. It just all kind of ties together. Now, if now the perceptions that I had of terrorism when I first started this class was that terrorism was mainly just religion based. I thought that a terrorist group attacked others solely due to religions. Um, and sometimes government, if they didn't like the way that a government was run or their beliefs were a little bit different, I always thought a terrorist were also um, international. I thought it was mainly people from other countries who attack other countries who were terrorists, uh, which I know is kind of biased and is definitely um, discriminatory. So my thought process has changed on that all the way. Um, anyone can pretty much be a terrorist if their goals are the same as even an international terrorist. So we have them here in the United States, uh, you have them in other countries, you have them on a large scale, small scale, so an individual versus a group. Um, I also learned how small groups that have a belief that could be like save the polar bears could also potentially turn into a terrorist group, which is kind of crazy to think about, but yes. Um, and then I also learned that there's a lot more politics behind it. So that kind of scares me because I'm not honestly big into politics, but after reading some of the text and friction, it definitely brings it close to home. Um, and then also another thing that I enjoyed the most was just the different types like unfreezing, personal grievance, um, just stuff like that, learning the different types of radicalization definitely brought it into clear um, and then the discussion boards between me the professors and the other students helped me get different insights i love to play the devil's advocate so this gave me the chance to do so um, so pretty much my opinion of terrorists has changed completely done a 180 and i actually thoroughly enjoyed all the information that i learned in this class and it's kind of sad to see it end um, but yes it was awesome. So thank you for listening to this video. Hopefully it's not too long. <laughs> All right. Bye. Have a good day.